Hello, and welcome to the review on evolution. In the review of evolution, we would like to quickly define a few key terms. The first of which I'd like to point out is the term species. When we refer to a species, we're actually going to be referring to an interbreeding population of organisms that produce healthy, fertile offspring. Population, we will refer to that as a group of organisms of the same species living within a particular area. And there will be a term speciation, which involves, or involves the evolution of one or more new species from a single ancestral species. Again, a species refers to a population, not an individual. Evolution right now, we're going to broadly define as change over time. The term adaptation is an inherited trait that increases a population's chance of survival and reproduction within an environment. And fitness is the ability of an organism to survive and pass on its genes to the offspring. With these terms here, now let's go ahead and examine evolution. The concept itself has been well around for quite some time. Uh, and scientists have noticed that populations were changing, but there lacked an explanation for this. There was no theory to explain why things were evolving. One of the attempts that was put forward that was eventually proven to be not fully correct was the theory of acquired characteristics. This is commonly known as Lamarckianism, named after Lamarck. What Lamarck proposed was that an organism that needs a particular part is going to use that part. That part will grow and develop, and that part will then be passed on to the offspring already developed. So, for example, if a giraffe tries to reach leaves above its head, it will stretch its neck. Its offspring will then be born with stretched necks. Now, that aspect has been shown to be not correct. However, he was correct in the concept of heredity. That is, successful traits are passed on to the offspring, with the acquisition of traits that he had incorrect. The theory that was proposed that did provide a valid explanation was proposed by Charles Darwin. Just so you know, one of the big pieces he made a lot of his observations on a ship named the Beagle. There he studied quite a bit of life, including those on the Galapagos Islands. His famous observations there involved bird species called finches. Very about, or from there, and that one outward, he slowly developed and refined his theory to explain this. His theory was called the theory of natural selection. Now, again, the key thing to understand here is in science, a theory is a well-supported set of ideas that explains observations in the past. It's not just an idea. It's something that is an explanation and well-supported. So, what does this theory involve? Well, Darwin had together his observations from the Galapagos Islands and elsewhere with some other information present at the time. One thing he tied in was from an individual, Malthus. Malthus was an economicist. He, so he studied economics and he studied human populations. What Malthus realized was the human population was growing at a faster rate than food production. That meant he saw exponential growth within the organism, but a limited resources. He said this was going to lead to competition. Darwin realized that this did not just apply to humans, but to multiple life forms all throughout the planet. Along with that, there were some other ideas that were tied in. For example, Darwin was unaware of Gregor Mendel, in which he may be familiar with from your discussion of genetics. Well, genetics and genes that Mendel worked with is the basis and the mode of heredity, how these traits are passed along. Darwin understood that traits were passed along, they were heritable, they would be passed on from parents to offspring, but he didn't know the mechanism. Gregor Mendel's discovery of genes provided us for a mechanism of both how traits are passed along and how they can change, basically mutation. So this is something we incorporate into our modern understanding that Darwin was unaware of. When you combine this understanding of genetics, DNA, heredity, and mutations, you get the concept of variation. So while Darwin didn't understand DNA, he did understand variations, and he knows that there's variations within populations. Well, you have competition for limited resources, and you have variation, some individual will be better at competing for those limited resources. Be them food, mates, sunlight, they're going to be able to outcompete others. And this 
provide what we call natural selection. So to put things differently, this process of natural selection, where you have individuals with different traits or different variations competing for limited resources and those, those being best suited ended up surviving or reducing. So the process of natural selection combines over time and the populations are going to change to show those traits more commonly and other traits less commonly. And this is basically evolution from a scientific perspective. So, having four points of natural selection, more individuals are born than will survive. There's a variation among those born within the population. Those with variation best suited to an environment, or we say best adapted to an environment, will survive better and produce more offspring. So this is what we call fitness. They will be more fit. These variations were traits that allow the individuals to become more fit will become more common in the next generation as those traits are variable. For example, let's say we have bunnies. So let's say we have a white bunny. Well, a white bunny in and of itself is neither good nor bad. You put that white bunny in the snow, and that trait is very advantageous. It's a positive adaptation because it will be less likely to be seen by a predator and eaten. You put that white bunny, however, in the desert where you put it in the grassland, and it's going to stick out very, very clearly and very likely to be eaten. So there will be a negative adaptation. So the traits that are going to help increase or decrease fitness are also based on the surrounding environment. So if we have this in down to genetics, what we really see is evolution is really a change in the real frequency of a population over generations. So it's not individuals that evolve, it's the overall population. So for example, let's say we have a particular trait over here, and if I look at the population right now, 60% of the population is homozygous dominant, expressing that set of traits. Another set is heterozygous, showing this sort of phenotype, and another type is homozygous recessive, showing a different phenotype. Over time, we might see a population where, let's say the homozygous dominant is actually advantageous. Well, then, over generational time, we're going to see the percent change where homozygous dominant is going to increase itself within the allele frequency. Maybe now 30% of those individuals are homozygous dominant, whereas the other two traits are going to decrease in that time frame. This can happen in a couple different ways. So we can have, for example, directional selection. Let's say here's my original population. And let's say here's one version of the alleles or the phenotypes over here, here's another type, and here's another type. And so this could be anything from, let's say, third color to height. We can have something called directional selection. So for example, let's say this is height. So let's say over here is short, over here is tall, and over here is medium. Let's well, say the population is skewed right now to be at this height. Well, over time, if being tall is advantageous, more tall individuals would reproduce and have offspring, thus tall would increase in the population. So overall, we would see a shift more towards this trait, and it becomes more centered. This is called directional selection. Likewise, let's say a trait is kind of is strongest towards the middle ground. We have stabilizing selection, where the population traits move inward. Finally, we have disruptive selection, where the two extreme versions of that particular trait are selected for. The final concept within evolution is basically what is referred to as Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Hardy-Weinberg is basically a proposal here of what is required for evolution not to occur. Basically, if the following five points are met, we do not have an evolving population. If any of these five points is not properly met, that we can say the population is evolving, or we can say the allele frequency of the population is changing. This could be for speciation or just overall shift in um, phenotypes. So what you need to not have evolution, you need the following. You're going to need completely random mating. So individuals cannot choose mates. All the alleles are basically mixed completely at random between male and female gametes. We need an extremely large population. We need no immigration or emigration. So that means other individuals of the species cannot move in or out of the region. Because that will then change the allele frequency with the traits they bring in or out. You cannot have any mutations occurring because the mutations are going to change the alleles. And you cannot have this process of natural selection that I will propose going on. If 
these five points are met, we do not have evolution. If they are not met, evolution is present. 